Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me just before we get into the presentation, show of hands, who has NBN currently either at home or in your business? Okay, this it seems to be that corner, just interestingly. Um, who uh, hasn't? Uh, who's not going to put their hand up, whichever question I ask? Thank you, Libby. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, NBN. I have a question if I could. Yes. Who is able to connect to the NBN now but is putting it off as long as they possibly could? <laughs> oh, okay, let's show our hands on that one. <laughs> well done. Okay, in terms of the agenda today, what we'll do is we'll talk uh, about the NBN, we'll talk about the NBN rollout uh, and the timing of that rollout. Uh, there are some key dates that you need to know, so we'll talk a little bit about those. Uh, we'll also talk about NBN special services, and they are important to uh, business. What options you have to replace special services. Uh, we'll go through a little bit of the pros and cons of each of those options. It's not going to be an exhaustive list, but the sort of the three main streams that you can go uh, through. Uh, a top 10 tips for success, and then the next steps. The NBN, there's a lot of really good material to talk about and there's some sort of things that we're just not going to get time to cover. Obviously the political debate, um, probably way too many political debates going on just at the moment, so uh, we won't enter into any of those. Uh, there's, I don't know if people are aware, but there was a change originally, we were going to have fibre running into every single house and home and business, but that model changed because of the cost and uh, timing of the rollout. Uh, the actual uh, Timing has been delayed, the costs have been delayed. I actually did some research and the original budget to build the NBN was going to be $29.5 billion. Uh, the latest estimate is it'll run to 50.1. So, so a, certainly a very, very steep increase on the original budget. Uh, things like 5G, so the upcoming mobile technology, will that in fact replace the NBN and will we have this $51 billion white elephant? Um, that's uh, quite often questioned and asked. Uh, the NBN it was always identified as something that the government would build and then sell off and privatise, so who's going to buy it? Uh, Telstra has set up a separate infrastructure division uh, and there was some recent press around that. So some really good material there and I'm not going to cover any of it uh, for the sake of time. But uh, happy to have a conversation afterwards. Uh, I'll be around and uh, uh, I'll sort of, for a coffee, I'll tell you anything. So, um, <clears throat> all right, so just a couple of dot points about Acumentus. We are vendor independent and we're a consulting organisation and what that means is we can put your needs at the centre of what we do. We're not trying to force a round peg in a square hole and uh, sell you something that's not going to fit. Uh, our focus is really around uh, designing solutions, migrating to new solutions and helping manage uh, the vendors that are part of that. And as was mentioned earlier, we are NBN Business Accredited Advisors. So what is the NBN? We've all heard about it, it's in the press extensively uh, and it is uh, a federal government initiative and it is in fact the largest infrastructure project in Australia's history, which when I read that, I thought that's quite significant when you think about roads, when you think about uh, you know, a lot of the electrical grid, when you look at the you know, hydro power stations and setups, this is the biggest. And probably what a lot of people don't realise is that the NBN is a wholesale only provider. What that means is you can't actually buy anything from the NBN, you need to buy through a retail service provider, uh, so that's people like you know, Telstra Optus, NBN, uh, sorry, Telstra Optus, uh, TPG, there's a plethora, over a hundred different uh, retail service providers that you can get your services from. Uh, it's been rolling out since 2010, so it's certainly been uh, around, initially kicked off in Tassie, for those of you that have connections there. Uh, and they're a good way through the rollout. So 52, uh, sorry, 5.2 million premises uh, the NBN currently has connected with a target of 8.1 by the end of next year. So they're a good way through, they've got some ambitious plans to finish that off. And the bottom line is, and you know, my dear mother used to say, whilst you're, important, whilst you're entitled to an opinion, it doesn't necessarily mean they'd want to hear it. And in this instance, it's coming, no matter what, you don't have a choice, uh, it's being rolled out, uh, and uh, that's the, the, the end of it. Um, it does cop a fair bag in the old NBN. Um, 469 appointments missed uh, 
just about every day. There's complaints about the cost soaring, the slow rollout, services that get connected that don't deliver the expectations that people uh, have wanted, uh, etc. So it really does copper bagging. I think it's fair to say uh, good news doesn't sell newspapers. Uh, and second of all, people don't talk about the trains that run on time. It's not newsworthy, so uh, people don't talk about it. There are some you know, really good reasons that the NBN was originally set up and uh, uh, you know, it was originally around being globally competitive and I don't know whether you can remember those charts where they'd have all the different countries and how advanced they were within their broadband uh, and Australia was always sort of well down the list and this initiative is really aimed at driving that. Uh, it enables people to work more flexibly uh, and there's some really good stories about people that uh, take a sea change. They go to a beautiful exotic location that has an NBN uh, and then what they do is they start a business and run a business from an exotic location and they can do that with the flexibility the NBN delivers. Uh, so it does change the way people uh, work, it changes the way that people educate themselves. Anybody have uni students in the family somewhere? No one, so it's a couple. Good, and you know it gets. I've, I have. I've got two of them, and it surprises me that they don't actually need to attend lectures these days. They can do everything online. So it's either that, or I think the re real truth is that they just want to sleep in and uh, do what uni students do. But uh, yes, they do, and it's also bridging the divide between country and city, between uh, the old and the young, and and really around social inclusion. Uh, Ten point nine billion dollar. Uh, increase to the GDP uh, next, or sorry, year after next, 2021, and 31,000 jobs. So certainly some very admirable um, uh, objectives and reasons for doing it. I think the real reason, and this is a sort of a bit of an insight and a bit of a secret, I think the real reason is to keep families together because there was a wise man, Will Ferrell, that said, before you marry a person, you should make them use a computer with slow internet to see who they really are. And I think that's true. It's, uh, you know... <laughs> It's internet rage if you uh, have experienced or know somebody <laughs> like that. So, okay, in terms of the actual rollout, it is a progressive rollout. It's going out region by region. There are uh, a, a, literally thousands of regions that are being rolled out progressively. And what the NB do, NBN do, once a particular region is set up, you will receive, receive a letter in the mail which says that A, you're ready for service. <coughs> but in the very same letter they say, the countdown to disconnection has begun. So what you do is you have uh, an 18-month window in which to migrate your existing phone and basic phone and internet services over to the NBN, uh, and they call that in each region a regional rollout disconnection date. So you have a regional rollout disconnection date that is for basic phone and internet. What a lot of people don't uh, always consider is all the other services that might be uh, using telecommunications within your business. Uh, so the trusty old fax machine. Uh, believe it or not, there are a lot of businesses that still rely on a fax machine. I was actually surprised that there was a, a, a doctor's surgery in a hospital that could not email you anything, but they could fax you whatever you wanted, which was uh, quite bizarre. But there are people that use it, and you need to factor that into your migration plans. So there's things like FPOS machines, uh, high caps terminals in doctor's surgeries. Uh, there are a lot of other, uh, if you like, um, equipment that uses telecommunications that would be delivered by the NBN and you need to factor that into uh, a change or a move to the NBN. Uh, the other point there, and I just thought I'd bring this up, and that is the medical alarm or a pendant, uh, probably more relevant in a domestic situation or a, um, a residential situation where, say, there's uh, somebody with uh, ill health. Um, quite often they will run across the telephone network and you actually need to factor that into your migration. Uh, so there's two parts to that. One is it's important to contact the device manufacturer to make sure that the device will work on the NBN because it is a different technology. Uh, and second of all, you can register that premises with the emergency requirement with the NBN and they will manage that migration with kit gloves. So just something to, to bear in mind. On to NBN special services. So these are a range of more complex telecommunication services. Uh, they've grouped them into four groups. That's not an exhaustive list, but they are some examples. And uh, uh, each one of those run to a different time schedule. Uh, and they, ha they have what they've called a special services disconnection date. So that relates to the actual type of service and then you get your regional rollout disconnection date. Uh, and with ISDN, for example, that 
has a forced disconnections commencing from September this year. And I'll go a little bit into ISDN just so you know how and where it's, it's relevant. Um, I liken this a little bit to the um, Vietnam War, or certainly a quote from the Vietnam War, and that is, anybody who isn't confused really doesn't understand the situation. Um, and that is because you've got 2,000 uh, regions, or more, a couple of thousand regions, all that have their own disconnection date. You've got four different groups of products that also have a different disconnect, disconnection date again. So there, it really can get quite uh, complicated. So what exactly is ISDN? And for those of you that are not aware, ISDN is the uh, traditional service that's connected businesses uh, to the phone network, if you like. So it's the, the service that if somebody rings your main number, it'll usually be delivered across ISDN. If you have a 1300 or 1800, again, it'll normally come across your ISDN service. As I say, disconnections from September 30 this year. Uh, and as I say, it's commencing from then. Uh, and you do need to transfer to an alternative service. That transfer is not automatic, so you do actually need to act. Uh, the upside is that um, you don't actually need to wait for the NBN to move off ISDN, so you can do that uh, prior to your rollout timeframe. I actually recommend uh, allowing about six months from planning to the actual date of migration. Bigger organisation, more complex, I'd you know, allow more. A smaller organisation, uh, simpler, I'd allow less. But as a stake in the ground, six months is a good time frame to uh, allow for your migration. How do you know if you use ISDN? A uh, couple of simple ways. Check your phone bill's probably the easiest. Telstra calls it on-ramp. Uh, Optus call it multi-line. It could be referred to as a PRI or a BRI or, uh, or ISDN. So forced disconnections from September. Carriers actually don't have a choice. They're legally obligated to disconnect copper services. So, um, yeah, and dates are non-negotiable. So the last thing I think you'd want to be doing is talking to an overseas call centre, trying to get an extension where they don't understand the question, let alone know the answer. So my encouragement to you is to you know, act now, act sooner rather than later to give yourself that time. There's a lot of information floating around the industry. There's um, you know, people that are trying to make a, a, an opportunity out of it and they'll tell you you need to you know, replace your phone system or you need to, uh, uh, you're need you going to lose your phone number and fear, uncertainty and doubt. Uh, I will say that all of these are fake news. So you don't actually need a new phone system. You can use existing phone system if you would like to. It is an opportunity where you can review that and it could be some value in uh, looking at different technology, but that's not necessarily the case. If you manage it properly, you keep your existing phone number. Uh, in most instances, you'll pay considerably less. So that is probably some of the good news out of this is that uh, the alternatives are generally cheaper uh, than ISDN. Uh, in terms of power outages, you may have heard that when the, N, when the power goes out, your NBN drops, and that is the case, that it does rely on power. Uh, however, there are alternatives. You can you know, provide battery backup and there's some uh, strategies you can put in place to address that. And you can have a disru disruption to your service. Again, not necessarily the case. If it's managed right, there's uh, strategies and uh, uh, things you can put in place so that's not uh, happening. So what options do you have? If you like, I've distilled it down to three. One is what's known as SIP trunks. Uh, and they are, if you like, an alternative to ISDN. I'll go into each of those in a little bit more detail. Uh, the next is using mobiles, and uh, mobiles are uh, you obviously used you know, extensively uh, in and around business. And what I'm calling their UCAS, which is Unified Communications as a Service. Uh, and that is, in effect, a phone system that's in the cloud. So uh, it ju just means that you don't need to manage it and, uh, and worry about it. Uh, which also includes SIP trunks. But I'll go through each of those. SIP stands for Session Initiation Protocol, and I knew that you were all wondering that and wanted to know. Um, and what that is, is in effect the technology that sets the phone call up and it connects into the phone network. But the actual uh, phone, the phone call is actually delivered across your internet connection or across your broadband connection. So there's actually two layers to it. Uh, so it sets up the calls, it'll set up a video call, it'll uh, handle messaging sessions, etc. Uh, and 
probably one aspect to it is you need to not just put in place this SIP <coughs> service, but you also need to make sure you've got enough bandwidth on your data connection to carry that extra traffic. And depending on you know, the scale and size of your business would determine whether you need something specific. So the pros with SIP trunking is you can use your existing phone system if you choose to. Uh, there are more than 200 providers of SIP. So it's a very competitive market. Uh, there are a lot of people that are vying for your business and uh, it can be very cost effective. And it's cost effective in two areas. One is that uh, your line costs are generally much cheaper and second of all, the call costs are much cheaper. So there is some good news around uh, SIP. Uh, it's easy to scale up and down, so you can uh, you know, add one, two, five, ten services or drop down in whatever increments you like, whereas previous service you had to buy them in blocks of ten or box, blocks of twenty, uh, which uh, can be more difficult. And because with the alternatives they actually had to deliver a physical connection to your business, there was a lot more time involved. So uh, with this you can sort of turn it around in some, some organisations will connect services in uh, if you like, hours and days rather than weeks and months. So it really enables you to be a lot more nimble. The cons of SIP trumps, there are 200 providers, <laughs> which is the flip side of the uh, one of the positives. And that is that it's complicated. There's lots of people you need to look at. Uh, it's not all the same. Every SIP provider is slightly different. Uh, an example there, some will natively support uh, fax machines and some won't. Um, and there's, a, if you like, a, a whole lot of uh, considerations that you may need to work through before you uh, get fully on board with SIP. The other thing with SIP and an existing phone system is you've still got an existing piece of hardware there that you need to uh, continue to maintain and upgrade and patch and things like that. So. If that's a consideration, if that's an issue, then uh, you know that's certainly uh, a potential con. I won't go into this slide in a lot of detail, only to say that some phone systems today are IP ready. All you need to do is reprogram them and they'll work sort of out of the box. And that's if your phone system's sort of you know, three or so years old. Uh, if it's five years old or more, most likely it's gonna need an upgrade. So that could be a hardware upgrade and or a software upgrade. Uh, and then the third option is if your phone system is an old system uh, and it's not IP capable, you can actually get a little box that sits between your phone system and the phone network and in effect what it does is converts. So it talks um, you know, old world to the phone system and SIP to the phone network. So uh, uh, they are sort of some of the, the detailed options. Onto mobiles, which is another option to replace your existing ISDN. Uh, obviously inexpensive, easily scalable, everybody's got one in their pocket. You know, if you wanted to speak to someone, you ring them, you get directly connected. So there's a lot of sort of fairly obvious benefits around um, using a phone system. Um, you know, it's an integrated device, so you can obviously do more than just make phone calls. So uh, yeah, obvious benefits with, um, with mobiles. Some of the drawbacks and some of the cons. Wherever you are, it'll present a mobile number. So if, for example, uh, you want to uh, position yourself as being larger than life and a lot of small businesses want to pump themselves up, uh, you are always seem to be receiving a call from a mobile number, which implies it's micro, small, person to person, that sort of thing. It may fit your business, but for some it doesn't. Uh, you've got issues around the actual device itself. Um, it's very, very common to see people hovering around a charging station uh, because their devices are used that often. And if you've got business critical communication being tied to that device that's being used for so many, um, that can be an issue. Um, I've got a, a mate of mine who runs a business. His default position is he will buy everybody in the business a mobile in the a mobile phone and a phone number on the way in, on the basis that he gets to take it back on their way out. The reason he does that is because uh, with that phone number is a level of, uh, if you like, uh, intellectual property. Uh, there's a number of business contacts, uh, and when people ring his business and they ring an individual, he wants to make sure that particularly if they go to a competitor. They don't walk out with you know, his phone number and all the marketing money that he's put into developing his business potentially goes off with an ex-employee. So one of the considerations, if you choose to use a mobile phone uh, for primary business communications, you know, maybe think about who owns it and what they can do with it. 
And probably the other point there is that you know, for basic stuff, the mobiles are really good, but if you want to do things like after hours divert to another location or have somebody answer it or a contact centre or a follow the sun arrangement whereby um, you're offering customers service 24-7, then mobiles uh, don't really cut it. Things like uh, governance, so if you need to have calls recorded uh, for particular reasons, then again, not something you can do with a, a mobile phone. Okay, so on to the... the Final of the, the three options, if you like, unified communications as a service. And I suppose in simple terms, that is a phone system that sits in the cloud. Uh, it's, it's certainly that, and it's, it's a lot more than that, in that uh, typically UCAS will also do video communications, uh, and that's video point-to-point, -point, group conferencing, webinars, all those sort of richer features. Uh, it'll do voice conferencing, uh, it can be mobile, and it can be mobile in a number of different ways, and I'll go into that a, a little bit later. Uh, conferencing, as I say, uh, w um, voice conferencing or video conferencing. And when I say as a service, what that means is there's no upfront capital outlay. So it sits in the cloud, and in effect, you subscribe to it. Uh, so you can scale up and down as you need to. Uh, because it's in the cloud, you don't actually need to patch it, maintain it, uh, upgrade the system and that sort of stuff. It's just taken care of, you use it, you pay a fee for it per month, so uh, that is what UCAS is about. It works on just about any device, so you can have a physical handset on your desk if that's the type of business you have and use. Uh, it'll work on a desktop or a laptop, so a you know, software and application that sits on that. Uh, it'll work on a tablet, uh, iPad or an Android tablet, it'll work on a smartphone. Uh, so in effect, you have total flexibility around uh, what you do with it and how you use it. It does have high definition voice, which is uh, uh, something that stands out when you haven't used it before and you get to high definition voice, it is quite a standout. Um, and probably the last couple of points on, on that slide there is that, uh, if you like, it is fully featured. So if you want to migrate and if you want to, for example, have a call queue where somebody comes into your business and it's, um, uh, you know, dial one for this, two for that, and then there's a you know three or four callers already, say, waiting for a help desk. That functionality you can just add on as you want and as you need. Uh, and I say at the bottom point there, it levels the playing field. What I refer to there is that typically a lot of the functionality in UCAS, you know, you'd pay tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars for, and because of that, only the top end of town would get it. Uh, what this does is, for a monthly fee, means that you know anybody can get it. So you can get efficiencies out of your business by using a lot of that functionality. So the pros and cons of UCAS, uh, it is cheaper than U uh, ISDN and typically cheaper in uh, line costs, uh, call costs, uh, and there are options where you can have calls bundled in so you don't have to then manage your phone bill and look at who spent what and that sort of stuff. It's just lumped in uh, and there's not that management overhead. Uh, you can run it on a mobile fleet, if you like. So you can run it on a mobile handset uh, and that obviously frees your business from a fixed location. Uh, flexibility and scalability up and down as you need. Uh, you get all the advanced functionality uh, and obviously I said before, pay as you go. Uh, some of the cons, uh, because you're actually changing the system, uh, there is the need for, to retrain people. So typically a, a once off thing, but it is a, a something that you need to factor in uh, when you are putting in a new system. Uh, because it's in the cloud, you can't do bespoke customization. So if you have a particular function that you need, often you'll only get that through a specific on-premise uh, system that you'll need to have customised. So that's um, something that is one of the cons. Uh, you don't ever actually own the system. For some people, they want an asset, they want something they can see and see what they've paid money for. Uh, others people just simply want to use it. Uh, and you know, the other part to that is some people have had their phone systems for years and years and years and years and they just want to keep sweating it and using it. Uh, and obviously with the pay as you go, you, while you pay for it, you keep it. Well, as soon as you stop paying for it, you don't. So it's that sort of um, analogy. All right, now on to the top 10 tips for a successful uh, migration to the NBN. First of all, you need to know your disconnection dates for each of your sites. Uh, and on uh, the Acumetus website, I've put a link on the NBN page that you can 
that will take you to, uh, if you like, an address checker. So you can check uh, when your particular site is being uh, migrated or available for service on the NBN. Uh, the second one there is to audit your services and equipment. So know exactly what you've got. Uh, remember to factor in all those obscure services or less obvious services, so fax machines and FPOS machines, modems, etc. Uh, need to make sure you've got enough bandwidth for your uh, voice and your data requirements. So a consideration there. For those of you that have multi-site, my recommendation is to create a plan site by site. Uh, and then also, number six there is really to change once, get a plan around all your sites. A lot of the benefits for uh, NBN and UCAS or SIP comes in the fact that the sites can operate in effect as one. So, you know, no charge phone calls, you can see uh, availability and presence information across your broader organisation. So I would encourage you to consider moving, probably when your first site's due, to look at moving all of those within a fairly short time frame. Uh, having said that, I wouldn't flick the switch and walk away. I'd do a managed migration, so it's something that you need to plan well and make sure that uh, uh, you know, where you can run the two in parallel, parallel for a period of time. Uh, you can also do things such as uh, 4G backup, and there are uh, routers, if you like, where you can put a SIM card in, uh, and if for some reason uh, the NBN uh, fails or doesn't cut over in time, at least you've got some communication you can run your business on. Uh, point number nine there is uh, I would recommend something that's integrated, so works uh, right across uh, the different systems within your business, so uh, uh, that's certainly important. Something that's consistent between sites so that if you like, somebody can go to a, a different site and just turn on and uh, start working from wherever they are. Uh, and also something that's future proof. So the last thing you want to be doing is throwing a whole bunch of money at something only to find out that it has a uh, very limited shelf life. And uh, for example, UCAS, because it's upgraded and updated and that sort of stuff, it's a, a bit of a set and forget. And the last point there is make time your friend. Uh, allow at least six months, uh, you know, the, the longer you've got, the more runway you've got in front of you, the more you have time to respond if things don't quite pan out as you might have expected. So next steps, there are on the Acumetis website, we've got some checklists, uh, we've got some migration guide, we will have some webinars coming, so they look a little bit like that. Uh, if you go to the Acumenist website, you're welcome to download and use those. Uh, I'm happy for people in the room uh, to spend 45 minutes on the phone with you, uh, no charge, no obligation, and happy to work through, and if I can give you some uh, uh, assistance and a way forward, then I'm certainly happy to do that. So that's where I wanted to get to in the presentation today.